about binomial probability and it's uh, it's probably one of the more important topics in the unit because this is a, a pretty significant connection between uh, simple probabilities and uh, normal distributions and other types of distributions. So we have our four conditions. These four conditions need to be in play in order for you to consider a distribution to be binomial. Okay, there needs to be a fixed number of trials, fixed probability, independent events, and two outcomes, either success or failure in some capacity. All right. There's plenty of instances where you can kind of look at more than two outcomes and think maybe it's not binomial, but then it, you can categorize those multiple outcomes as either being success or failure and take something that might not seem like it's binomial and make it binomial. All right, so we got that formula there. I'll show you. I'll show you the TI approach, but I'll also uh, do some problems with the formula because it's kind of interesting. So I put this little fake pop quiz on the side here. Uh, so you could see uh, there's five questions. There's four choices. Well, there's five questions. There's five things to answer. It's just you you weren't given any questions. So this is pure randomization. So well. I guess it could be pure randomization. People have different schemes when they don't know how to answer a question on a test or a quiz. So like use the abacadabra approach or whatever, you know, like to, to quote unquote uh, randomly come up with answers. But um, you know, some people just pick a, pick a letter and go down the line with that. Like if there was a, a hundred question assessment and you didn't know what any of the answers were, you might just pick a choice and go right down the line, selecting that choice for every answer. All right. So all I really want you to do at this point is decide on an answer. Now, if you're just doing it on the screen, just kind of on a separate paper, just come up with an answer for each one of these questions. All right. Again, you don't, you don't have the actual question. So you're, you're doing this based off of like whatever you want. You're, you're just saying, all right, well, uh, it feels like a B situation. So that's what I'm gonna go with for number three, whatever whatever you think of, all right? So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make my selections here. The, these were these were my selections. I, I guessed. I didn't I didn't study for the quiz. I tried to get away with one. You know, like maybe maybe I focused all my attention on science and I neglected my math. And because of that I wasn't prepared at all, so I just guessed on the the five questions and this is what I came up with. Alright. So let me tell you what the actual answers were. So this is the answer key. Yep. All right. So the actual answers were B, B, A, C, C. All right. So that means that I got number one right, number two I got wrong, number three I got right, number four I got wrong, and number five, I got wrong, All right? So I got two out of five correct. Honestly, for purely guessing, it's not too bad. 40% correct without having to study. I mean, some people are willing to live with that. So I got two correct. All right. So what we can do is we can create a distribution of the number of questions that are correct, or number that you got correct. So I'm just going to kind of do that off on the side. So we'd have X and we'd have, we would have F. X would be the number correct. There's five questions. It's possible that you didn't get any of them correct. You may have only gotten one correct. 
two, three, four. Maybe you got them all, all correct. Maybe you got lucky. All right. Now this is a small sample, but I got two questions correct. So I'll put a little, little tally mark in the two. All right, so let's just go around the room real quick and just tell me what you got. All right, we'll just start off with Pierce and then work our way around in a clockwise fashion, you know, within each cluster then. So it's kind of like a, like a, a spiral of Archimedes. So we're going, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, and then whoosh, that's pretty cool actually. Okay, so Pierce, how many did you get right? Um, I, I didn't understand, so I just mocked like exactly what you wrote. Oh, okay. Okay, so you got two. All right. What's that? Yeah, yeah, go around. You did the same. Okay. All right. Uh, why don't we do that again? All right, so I got one right. Oh, I mean, sorry, I got two right. Take your five guesses, and I'll give a different key. All right. Uh, if if you did it if you did it correctly the first time, then you don't have to do it again. You know that's fine. So you don't have to change anything up. But if you if you didn't get the uh, you you could actually even keep your if you made your own selections, your own individual selections, and kept track just with your unique values. You don't have to do anything new. So this is just for the folks who didn't get it get it the first time. All right. So D B A C A. All right. So you know what I'll even change mine. Whatever. Doesn't matter. So I got and I guess this could happen, right? I've done that plenty of times. Great everybody's everybody's quiz with an answer key that was for a different version. All right, so. Oh man, I only got one right now. All right, well, regardless. I didn't expect to do well, but you know, if you're gonna guess on every single question, you're, you're probably gonna stumble onto a right answer at some point. It's just a question of how often are you gonna stumble onto a right answer. All right. So, let's try that again. Pierce, how many did you get right? One. One. All right, Luke? One. One. Peter? Zero. Zero, okay. All right, continuing on. We got uh, uh, Brody's group and, you know, just kind of, just shout out numbers. One. <laughs> well, in, in, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and I'll, I'll get to you in a minute, but. Two? Two, zero. One. Okay. One. Zero. You added an extra one. He said two. Oh, thank you. All right, keep going. One. One. Zero. 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 Three. That's some serious. A one. Two. A two. Three. A three. <laughs> I had the ACA. I had the ACA. It's always ACA. Do we have everyone? Oh one. Oh one. No, I literally said AC ACA. Anyone else? Oh one. Yeah, why would I write it? We good? All right, well, it, it looked like the most frequent outcome was the one, right? So, but we can definitely draw more conclusions from this. So we have five, 10, two, oh, poor quality, two. Two, then we had zeros the rest of the way. I mean, these are only discrete values because you're not gonna get a fraction of a question right. I mean, for multiple choice question, it's possible to get it for a free response, you know, if you get partial credit, All right, but that's not the case here. So we get a couple of zeros. 
All right. So it looks like we have kind of a little bit of symmetry, but it, it, there's definitely a little bit of a skew to it. But it's also a, a smaller sample size, so we didn't we didn't expect it to be this glorious masterpiece. But if we create a graph out of this, stat edit zero through five. I always hate wiping out a, a, a column of all this data because it took so much time to put it in. It's like, well, I guess I gotta do that again next year. I used to um, store all the data and programs into the individual calculators, my loaner calculators. I thought I had it all figured out. Then people started stealing my calculators. And even when they're not stealing them, they're just borrowing them and clearing them. They're like, oh, my calculator's not working. I know how to fix that. Clear the memory, clear the RAM. You know, like, it's, don't, don't clear it. You cleared out everything. Yeah, so. But I'm down to, like, six calculators from 14 that I had last week, so I don't know what's going on there. Thieves. <laughs> so anyway, I got this graph, or this data set, so I can graph it. Second, y equals, turn my plot on. All right, uh, if it's not already on, mine's already on. It's set to a histogram, because we did, we did something like this last, last week. All right, but it was a while ago, so if you need a refresher, hit enter on plot one hit enter on the word on, get down to the, the one that looks like a histogram, make sure that X and frequency are L1 and L2 respectively. You'll see that the alpha lock turns on sometimes. I, I honestly don't know why that happens, but if you do see that, you know, like if you see the, 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 the blinking A, hit alpha again and it'll turn it off because if you go to hit one of these keys on the top, it's going to bring you to the, the F commands. Like if I hit, uh, well, I'll just do it. It'll bring up the, uh, the fraction tool or the function tool and so on. So it's, it's kind of aggravating. All right. So and then you find yourself kind of having to go back, you know, quit out just to kind of reset your bearing. So if you see that, if you happen to see that alpha lock on, all right, just hit alpha again and then hit zoom stat, zoom nine. And it gives you a pretty decent looking histogram in this case, but we know that we can't always rely on the calculator to come up with the diagram that we want. So we go into a window, you see that it goes from zero to six. Six is a little on the high side. It doesn't seem to be overly relevant, but it's not causing any trouble, so it's okay. The X scale should be one, so that, that seems to be reasonable. And so you're looking at something that's centered around, if I hit trace, from zero to less than one, so those are all my zeros. From one to less than two, those are all my ones. Two to less than three, those are all my, all my twos, and there's two of them, and, and so on. But it seems to be centered around one, but it's definitely asymmetric, but it's not like abominable, right? It, there, there does seem to be some attempted symmetry here. I and mean, we only had, I believe, 19 values. So the fact that there's a, such a small sample size tells me that we, we, we're not even close to being able to draw a conclusion on this, all right? But because it's binomial, and we know it's binomial because we have a fixed number of trials, there were, there were five questions, all right? We don't think about the number of attempts on the, it's not sampling. It's not the number of attempts for the pop quiz. It's the number of questions that the pop quiz contained. Fixed probability, all right? Assuming that it's an ordinary multiple choice assessment, you know, not one of those weird ones where it's like uh, select all that apply kind of thing, you know, not mul multiple answer, multiple choice, so only one correct answer. You have a one in four chance of selecting the correct answer, all right? Uh, independent events, well, that one we gotta have to sort of suspend our disbelief because you know, if it's a if it's a topic based assessment, if you don't know how to do question one, you probably don't know how to do question two, three, four, or five either. You know, because if you didn't study for the assessment and they're all related to the same content, 
then there is a level of dependence there in a practical sense. But in a pure probabilistic sense, we're looking at it from the just just by the numbers, how many choices are there and how many are right. All right? There are four choices, there's one right answer. If I if I select choice B, it does not mean that choice B is no longer available to be selected later on. All right? So that's the independence that they're referring to here. All right? So it's not like the case of a deck of cards where you pull a queen out of the deck, you have one less queen to work with. So I pull a B out of my, of my sample space, it's no longer available. No, I, I can still use a B again, all right? It's not like a knockout pool for uh, fantasy football. You know, like once you, use, once you pick the team, you're, you, can't, you can't pick the team anymore. That would be a dependent relationship, all right? This is independent, you can, you can pick the same team over and over again. All right, two outcomes, success or failure. Well, that's the thing. You kind of look at it like there's four choices. Doesn't that mean that there's four outcomes? Yeah, but they can be categorized in two ways, right or wrong. There's one way to be right. There's three ways to be wrong. All right, so there's different levels of each outcome, the success or failure, but there's still the two, the two possible outcomes. All right, so all of that explanation uh, that was not even close to grammatically correct, what I just said, but all of that answers the next question. So X represents the number of correct guesses. Is this a binomial setting or binomial situation? Well, yeah, because there's a fixed number of trials, fixed probability, independent events, two outcomes. All right. The fixed number of trials, again, were the number of questions. There were five questions. All right. That one people have kind of struggled with in the past. They're like, if you're taking a quiz, under what circumstance would you have variable numbers of questions? Well, like in a normal high school math class setting? I, I, I can't think of any circumstances, but like the, there would be plenty of instances where if you finish the assessment with enough time to spare, maybe you could tackle the bonus question. All right, you probably relate to an example like that where there's 20 questions, depending on how fast you finish those 20 questions, you might be able to take a crack at the bonus question. If you don't finish the 20 questions, then you, you, you can't tackle the bonus. That, that would be a variable situation because under cer some circumstances, you would have 20 questions and in other circumstances, you'd have 21 questions, all right? But that's not the case here, so it's irrelevant. Fixed probability, probability of success is one fourth and that never changed. Independent events. All choices are available at all times. So for all trials, because time isn't really a variable here. So, you know, it's the way we speak, we would say at all times, but you know, it's really all trials. All right, two outcomes, success or failure. That one kind of explains itself. You know, it, it is literally success or failure. You got it right or you got it wrong. All right, so right or wrong. All right, but then we have to calculate the probability of getting exactly two correct. All right, so we know that the most likely outcome, just by experimentation, observation, is that you'll get one correct answer. All right, we saw that here. Common sense kind of tells us that too. You get a one in four chance of getting a question right. So out of every four questions, you're probably looking to get around, on average, one question right. So there's five questions. So you're, you got the one right, you're working on maybe getting the second one right. All right. So what we want to know here is what's the probability of kind of beating those odds? You know, like we're expecting to only get one right. Let's see what would happen if we wanted to try to get, you know, push our luck, get a little bit more than what's expected. All right. So that's where the formula would come into play. The formula is one thing. 
the calculator approach is something something else and 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 what happens is since the the AP exam is sort of kind of um, archaic in the sense that they expect you to do things the old way while allowing you to do things the new way meaning like they they want you to use formulas but they understand that you're going to use calculators to crunch the numbers so really what it boils down to is that they're looking for a setup that's rooted in the old ways but then you can use the calculator any way you want after that all right so number of trials we had five trials we answered five questions the number of successes I wanted to get two correct. So that would be my X value of two. Probability of success on any one trial, in general, that's just going to be one fourth. Q would be the probability of failure on any one trial. So one minus one fourth, also known as three fourths. So when I pop into the binomial probability theorem I would say 5c2 times 1 fourth raised to the second power 3 fourths raised to the it would be 5 minus 2 power which is to the, to the third power so once you have the setup like I said you could do the rest any way you want which is just, I, I don't know. They, they, they just haven't rethought things in a while, all right? Because what, what people kind of train themselves to do is write this stuff out without having any idea why these things work the way they do. And then just, okay, I'm gonna pop it into the calculator. All right? So I'm gonna show you the, the why part of it now, and then we'll, we'll get into shortcuts after the fact. But, we're looking at one fourth raised to the second power, which, you know, this may seem a little juvenile here, but one fourth squared is the same as one fourth times one fourth. It's not to insult your intelligence. I'm going somewhere with that. All right. Bless you. Five minus two is equal to three. Bless you. So three fourths multiplied by itself a total of three times all right so these are showing two instances two questions right and the other trio here would be three questions wrong but if we think back to the multiplication rule when we say getting two questions right and three questions wrong, what we're saying is two questions right, then three questions wrong, in that order, specifically in that order. So the first two questions were right, the remaining questions were wrong, all right? But we know that that's not the only way that could have happened. And you could get two questions right without them being literally the first two questions that you attempt. All right. Maybe you get the first three questions wrong, and then you finish strong, and you get the, the last two questions right. All right. Maybe, maybe you kind of bookend it. The first question was wrong, then you get a little, little streak of a couple questions right, and then the remaining questions were wrong. It could, it could play out a bunch of different ways. All right. So this is, this 5C2, turns out it's 10. We've done this a few times computationally, so it's kind of asked and answered. But that 10 is the number of ways to get two questions right in five trials. All right, so what we're looking at here, it's uh, when I say 5C2 in this context, you know, you, you might remember, I mean, it's been a while, but you might remember 5C2 when we did it the last time. 5C2 was part of a question where I said, 
there are five people and we want to put them in groups of two. How many possible groups could you have? All right. It's really the same question. All right. So I want, I have five questions. All right. I want to put them in groups of two. Those groups of two would be the groups of two containing right answers. All right. So how many different groups of two can I have? I mean, it, it would really be the same idea as saying I have five people and I have two T-shirts, uh, two T-shirts uh, and those T-shirts say have big letter C on it. And I want to know the number of ways I can give those the, those T-shirts out to the to two individuals within the, the class, the group, whatever. All right. And those those T-shirts have a big letter C on them. All right. So I come up with 10 different ways. And then I hand the shirt, the T-shirts to those two people. It says C on it. C for correct. All right. So it's, it's really just another way of grouping. All right. And then by default, remember, we have groups of two out of the five. A natural group of three would exist containing the leftovers. All right. The incorrects. All right. Because if there are two from the five that we're saying are the correct, then whatever is left over, by definition, would have to be the opposite of that. All right. So that's the breakdown there. But when it comes to doing all this on the TI, and this is why I say, you know, there's the old way and there's the new way, the TI calculator is so much different. <laughs> if you go to uh, second VARS, you'll see an option. There's binome PDF and binome CDF. So second VARS option A. So binomial probability density function and then binomial cumulative density function. The cumulative is if you have an interval of values, right? So more than just one value, right? So this one is just a singular value. So I'm going to select binome PDF, ask for the number of trials, which would be five. Probability of success on any one trial, one fourth or 0.25 number of successes desired. It'll ask you to paste it. It doesn't say calculate, it just says paste. In which case, it just takes all the, out, uh, the values that you put in and pastes it into the home screen. So if you had a TI-83, this is what actually what you would type in. The N value followed by the P value followed by the X value. And then once you hit enter, it'll spit out the, uh, the actual probability. So binome PDF, five comma one quarter comma two and you get this decimal value here all right you could try to do a, a a fraction conversion just because it might be worthwhile so second vars option a all right so if you do math option one math enter and then enter again it'll convert it over to fraction form you don't have to worry about rounding if you get a nice fractional answer and definitely don't have to worry about you know writing this whole decimal out over and over again so in this table here under two we have 135 over 512 all right now probability wise i mean the 135 over 512 doesn't mean as much to me as the 0.26 i mean i could relate to that more so about 27 26 percent of the time i'm looking at getting two out of five questions right all right so if i took this multiple choice assessment or variations of this multiple choice assessment without studying at random and guessed a hundred times i'd only get as many as two right, or exactly two right, I should say, 27 out of those 100 times. All right, so not, not a good likelihood. All right. But having the setup and the understanding of you know, the approach on the calculator allows you to kind of whip through all the remaining problems here because all I'd have to do, I, do, I like second enter, I don't like scrolling up. If you hit second enter, second enter, it brings you back a couple computations. All I have to do is change that two to a zero. 
Again, I want to math frack that. I guess I am going to hit the up arrow. So 243 over 1024. All right, but the idea here is you start to come to an understanding that the binomial theorem, if you leave the x variable, can be defined based off of the other parameters. So we would say n, well, n is 5. So 5cx, 1 fourth to the x power, 3 fourths to the 5 minus x. So with this in mind, I mean, this would be a function of the variable x. I can, I can put this in a y equals. I can go to a table. I can do it with um, a list. There's a bunch of different uh, approaches that I could take. But, and, and I'll show you that real quick. If I go into y equals now and type in 5cx instead of 5c1, 2, whatever. So 5, math, probability, option 3, the NCR, put in an x, then multiply that by 0.25 raised to the x power, just easier to type the decimal form, and then 0.75 raised to the 5 minus x power. All right, so I'm just putting in my binomial theorem just leaving it in terms of variable x, now I've created a function. I mean, I could look at the graph. I gotta turn off my stat plot though. If you're, if you're in the y equals menu and you see the stat plot on, just hit enter on it and it'll just go away. But if I hit graph and I, I try to look at the picture, I mean, these numbers are so minuscule, it's not really gonna show up very easily. But if I go into table, I start seeing some values here. All right, and these are equivalent decimal values to what I had previously. You know, so it's just a question of, and, and you even get things that make sense logically. Like for example, six is giving me a zero. Well, yeah, that, that means that the probability of me getting six questions right is zero, it's impossible. There's only five questions. So of course I wouldn't get any more than five questions right. All right, so you could you can kind of get it this way if you put it in as a function of x. So f of x would be equal to this relation or this expression making the relation. All right, so you can go that route too. That's if you're comfortable with the decimals. If you want, if you want to have it in fraction form, then you'd go back and, and keep doing it the way I was doing it before. All right, so. 0.396 if you want if you're okay with the decimals three decimal places three significant I mean 396 three is 0 0.0879 four would be 0 0.0147 And then five, I mean, five's, five's a funky decimal, but if you, if you actually scroll right onto the number, you get a better look at it. And so that would be point, we'd have three zeros. It's not too crazy to convert it over into decimal form from scientific notation, so 977. All right, but you know, while I'm here, I might as well put these in their equivalent decimal form. So point, two three seven and two is point two six four all right so you can get it in fraction form you can get it in decimal form whatever whatever makes the most sense for you now we've just created a probability distribution. Now we did it with a frequency table. That wasn't a probability distribution. It could have been if we divided by the number of trials, but it still, it still wouldn't have been a probability distribution because it wouldn't have guaranteed that all the outcomes would add up to a value of one or the probabilities of percentages, right? 
But this, these values should all add up to one. If we did it right, they will. All right, we know how to compute the mean and standard deviation by hand, but you look at these numbers, these are not nice clean numbers like we worked with with the dice problem. All right, so we want, we want to find the, the, the nice easy ways to do this stuff. All right, and so that brings us back to the stat editor. All right, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, that's all good. I could type in all these values, but I'm not going to. I'm going to use the same strategy that I did when I made my, uh, my table of values by writing a function in terms of x, except I'm going to write my function in terms of L1. All right. So the way we're going to write it here, so it's similar structure. So 5, math, probability, option 3. Right on the L2 we do this, because right? we're going to apply this rule to the entire column. Then L1, so second one. All right, so that's 5C, whatever's in L1, times 0.25 raised to the L1 power times 0.75 raised to the 5 minus L1 power. Got to put the 5 minus L1 in parentheses, though, otherwise it gets all screwed up. All right. Once you do that, it auto-populates the column with those decimal values so you don't have to type them in yourself. All right. And then once you do that, stat calc 1, L1, L2, and so the x bar is what we're calling the mu. Mu is equal to 1.25, which actually it contextually doesn't make any sense because you can't get 1.25 questions right. Bless you. But the nearest discrete value to 1.25 is 1, and that's consistent with what we observed. All right. And then the sigma, 0.968. All right. So this is telling us our measure of spread is about 0.97968, right? So our expected value, so on average, we expect to get around 1.25 questions right. Now, in terms of the standard deviation, well, we know that that's a measure of spread, all right? That's the average displacement of any point along a distribution. So the average displacement for the outcomes of this experiment, because that's really what it was. So the, the experiment is 0.968 questions. Now there's, there's further use of that standard deviation, but that's, that's the actual interpretation of it, because standard deviation is the average displacement of any point along a distribution. All right, so we're just putting it in the context of the problem.